So today we continue our series on the study of the kingdom of God. And one of the things that I hope to do with you today is to persuade you that the kingdom of God is so much bigger than we sometimes realize. And encompassing languages of every kind, tongues of every t- kind, tribes of every kind. And one of the difficulties in spreading the kingdom is understanding and communicating to other cultures, even if they speak our own language. You can go to Great Britain, for example, and speak English and have a lot of miscommunication because we use the same words, but in different ways. You remember the rise of Ebonics back in the day. There literally is a language that is spoken that although it is English, it uses a lot of different phrases than we normally would use. Now, I'm from the South, so I'm familiar with what's called Hikonics. So I thought I would give you some examples today of Hikonics. For example, have you ever heard someone from the South use the word barn? It is an adjective. It means not domestic. As used in a sentence, he ain't American, he's from a foreign country. Bard is a verb, it's past tense of to borrow. As used in a sentence, my brother barred my pickup truck. Ranch is hickonics for a tool used for tightening bolts. Usage, I left my ranch in my pickup truck that my brother barred. All is a noun. It's a petroleum-based lubricant. Usage, I hope my brother puts all in my pickup truck where I left my ranch. Now, you can use a word and be convinced that somebody else actually understands that word when, in fact, they're hearing something different. This was one of the difficulties that Jesus had because Jesus preached on the subject of the kingdom of God more than any other subject. And the problem was that when he used the phrase kingdom of God, he meant one thing and his audience heard something different. You see, Jesus' listeners had heard of the kingdom of God before. For centuries, they had interpreted all of those prophecies of the coming of the Messiah in kingdom terms, but they did so militaristically and territorially. They believed that all those prophecies about the coming of the kingdom of God meant that Israel was destined for world domination. They remembered when when David sat on his throne and Israel was the most powerful nation in the world and they were not that now. They were a little subjugated people that one empire after another had conquered for centuries. But they believed That someday the son of David was coming. The prophets had said this clearly. And he would expand the borders of Israel and they would become the most powerful nation on earth again. So when Jesus came and he began to say the kingdom of God is at hand. Well, they got excited and and they didn't run to their house to get Bibles. They ran to their homes to get swords. They weren't signing up to become missionaries. They were signing up to become revolutionaries. And when Jesus would preach that God's reign was about to be realized and God would establish his dominion forever over everything, they said, amen, preach it. But they did not mean what Jesus meant. And their eagerness soon turned to frustration at his unwillingness to set up the kingdom like they thought that it was supposed to be set up. How come he hasn't recruited an army yet? How come he hasn't overthrown any dictators yet? And even John the Baptist, his cousin, who announced his coming, was thrown into jail by Herod, the kind of king that they thought the Messiah would actually come to overthrow. And John sent messengers from prison to ask Jesus, are you the one we're looking for? Are we supposed to be looking for somebody else? How come the kingdom isn't coming like we thought it was supposed to come? You see, they they had heard the right words, but they had the wrong definition. One time Jesus told a politician, 
My kingdom is not of this world. Well, where is it then? Luke chapter 17. And Jesus said, once having been asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, Jesus replied, the kingdom of God does not come with your careful observation, nor will people say, here it is, or there it is, because the kingdom of God is within you. Now, how do you tell a people who all their lives, when they heard kingdom of God, thought of acreage? How do you tell those people, no, when you hear kingdom of God, think heart. Let me tell you what Jesus did. He intentionally chose a very unique strategy. And and that is, he chose to teach about the kingdom of God through parables. Eleven times he said, the kingdom of God is like. Now, what he's doing is saying, you are confused. So I'm going to take an area of your life that you understand real well and i'm going to take a lesson out of that area and i'm going to see if you can make the connection between the kingdom dimension and where you are right now and one area they understood well was agriculture they were an agrarian society so several of the kingdom parables are about growing things and we're going to read the first one of these this morning And for the next few weeks, we're going to be looking at kingdom parables. But listen, the first one is the most important. If you don't get this one, nothing else is going to make sense. The very first thing you have got to understand about the kingdom is how it is like a sower in a field. So listen with me. We've got a long text that I want to read through this morning. We're going to read all of it because it is so critical to understanding kingdom planting. Matthew chapter 13, we're going to begin in the first verse. Follow along in your own Bible. This is what is recorded. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. Such large crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat in it while all the people stood on the shore. Then he told them many things in parables, saying, A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow, but when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil, where it produced a crop, a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. He who has ears, let him hear. The disciples came to him and asked him, Why do you speak to the people in parables? He replied, the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, but not to them. Whoever has will be given more, and he, he will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken from him. This is why I speak to them in parables. Though seeing, they do not see. Though hearing, they do not hear or understand. In them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. You will be ever hearing, but never understanding. You will be ever seeing, but never perceiving. For this people's heart has become calloused. They're, they hardly hear with their ears, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn, and I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes, because they see, and your ears, because they hear. For I tell you the truth, many prophets and righteous men long to see what you see, but did not see it, and to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. Listen then to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is the seed that was sown along the path. 
The one who received the seed that fell on rocky places is the man who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since he has no root, he lasts only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, he quickly falls away. The one who received the seed that fell among the thorns is the man who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke it, making it unfruitful. But the one who received the seed that fell on good soil is the man who hears the word and understands it. He produces a crop yielding a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. Like I said, you do not understand the kingdom. You can hear sermons on the kingdom. You can nod your head and say, amen. But you do not understand the kingdom until you understand why the kingdom is like a man sowing seed in a field. You see, this kingdom is a mysterious kingdom. It has secrets that some people get and some people never get here are two keys that you have got to know first the kingdom comes through a word not a sword in other words he is not ushering in a kingdom by military might not even frankly by supernatural power this is not a kingdom that armies or miracles are going to make people bow down to this is a kingdom ushered in by proclaiming the truth of God. He made it so clear in the same version of this story in Luke chapter 8. It says in verse 11, Jesus said, this is the meaning of the parable. The seed is the word of God. Now, most of us here, even if we did not grow up on a farm, have planted seeds. And you know, a seed is a powerful thing. Inside that seed, inherent in its essence, is life-giving power. And Jesus said that the Word of God is like that. The Word has regenerative, explosive, life-giving power in it. James 1, verse 18. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. The seed gives life. Again, look at 1 Peter 1, 23. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. So when people were asking Jesus, where are your armies? Where are your swords? He would just preach. And that frustrated people. Is that all you're going to do? Just preach? You're going to try to bring the kingdom of God just with preaching? What if people don't want to listen? That's the mystery. The secret was that this kingdom that Jesus was bringing to me was not coming in irresistible power. The reign of God was breaking into history and the mystery was that men had the freedom to refuse it. That's what people could not get. Well, I read all those prophecies in the Old Testament. The lion is going to lay down with the lamb. We're going to beat our swords into plowshares and God's going to rule over everything. And yep, that's exactly how it's going to look. Every one of those prophecies is going to come true when the king comes back. When the kingdom is finally consummated, every knee will bow. But right now, when the kingdom has initially come, God has given men the freedom to choose to enter it. And that means he has also given men the prerogative to turn their back on the reign of God. God is not driving and forcing men to accept his reign. He is letting them choose and that's what people could not understand even john his cousin but there's a second part of this mystery and it it not only does it come with a word not a sword but the kingdom comes only to those with good hearing 13 times in this parable jesus uses the word hear 
When Jesus ended the parable, he closed the, wor- closed the parable with these words. He who has ears, let him hear. And when he explained the parable, the very first thing he said was, listen. The very first thing you have to do to enter the kingdom of God is be a good listener. And this is why Jesus talked to people in parables. Because when, when you tell stories, you find out real fast who's really listening and who's just nodding their head, pretending to listen. Go back and look again at what he said in verse 11 in Matthew 13. He replied, you are permitted to understand the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but others are not. To those who listen to my teaching, more understanding will be given and they will have an abundance of knowledge. But for those who are not listening, Even what little understanding they have will be taken away from them. This is why I use these parables. For they look, but they don't really see. They hear, but they don't really listen or understand. This fulfills the prophecy of Isaiah that says, When you hear what I say, you will not understand. When you see what I do, you will not comprehend. For the hearts of these people are hardened, and their ears cannot hear. And they have closed their eyes. Understanding about the kingdom is not a matter of the intellect. It is a matter of the will. Now, did you hear what I just said? How can you explain the reign of God to a people who have no intention of being ruled? That's the problem. Jesus said another time in John 7, if anyone chooses to do God's will, he will find out whether my teaching comes from God or whether I speak on my own. Well, what is the will of God? It's the kingdom. Your kingdom come, your will be done. If you really want God to rule over your life, you will understand what Jesus is talking about. If you, if you want to do your own thing, if you want to have your own agenda, you want to follow your own rules, and all you want is a little side helping of religion, you're not going to get it no matter how much or how hard you listen. The problem is not the sower, and the problem is not the seed. The problem is the soil. Now remember... Jesus is in a boat and he's telling this story and there are thousands gathered on the side of a hill listening, a very huge crowd, way bigger than this crowd this morning. And and they all looked eager and they loved hearing sermons about the kingdom. They're nodding and they're listening and they look like a field that was plowed ready for good seed. But Jesus knew better. He knew that people listened to the kingdom with with different kinds of ears. You see, some people listen with closed ears. They are like the seed on a hard path. Back then, there were no fences. You had paths that were rights of way that people would walk on to get from one part of the country to the other. And so the path that was between fields would get hard because people were walking on it all the time. And the sower sows the seed and some of the seed falls onto the path and the path is so hard that even though the seed is very powerful, it cannot give life because the soil will not be penetrated. And Jesus said, that's how some people actually listen to me. Some people have hard hearts. Because they would rather have their sin than a sovereign run their life. You see, if you have sin in your life, now now we all make mistakes. So I'm talking about if you have a part of your life that you know is sin and you're not letting that go. You're not going to give it up. You could sit here Sunday after Sunday after Sunday to hear me preach and you could do that until Jesus comes back. But the seed will bear no fruit in your life because... The soil is hard, it's compacted, and that's what your heart is like. That's what our Bible says. Look at Hebrews chapter 3 with me. But encourage one another daily. By the way, every one of us could do better just at those words right there. 
as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. So Jesus realized that there are people that listen to him with closed ears because it doesn't matter what he would say. They're going to get up, they're going to go home, and they're going to keep their sin. Jesus also said that some people listen with cautious ears. They're like seed on rocky soil. Now, he doesn't mean that the seed was thrown into a pile of rocks. What he means, just like where I grew up in Florida, in Palestine, there is a lot of limestone layers. And you could have a limestone layer just a few inches beneath the soil. So what happens is when the sun comes out, and because of that rock being just a few inches beneath the soil, the the surface soil gets heated and that seed falls on that soil. And because the soil is warm, it grows faster than any other place in the field. And it looks like it might be the very best place in the field. But Jesus says, no, that seed can't take root there. You know, it, it's not easy to be a Christian. But it's very easy to start to be a Christian. Some people start. And they get really excited and fired up. And sometimes we pre preachers, we will manipulate people into coming to Jesus without actually having them take stock or really take uh, notice of what the actual commitment is that they are making. We preachers can be really good at, at talking about all the benefits of the kingdom, but not always talking about the responsibilities that are involved in the kingdom. And Jesus said those kind of people do great until hard times come. Feelings don't last in hard times. Only convictions do. And so Jesus says that some people nod their head when he talks about the kingdom. They think it's great, but they're not listening. Because when Jesus talks about the kingdom, he talks about dying to yourself. He talks about taking up the cross daily and following him. And somehow they never hear that part. See, Jesus said some people, they listen with crowded ears. That's like the seed that has fallen on soil with thorns in it. Now, again, he doesn't throw the seed into a big patch of weeds. It's, it's all soil, but the soil has weed seeds already in it. Weeds are natural to soil, right? You go anywhere and you till up some ground and do nothing, come back in a few weeks, what will have grown? Weeds. Not wheat, not corn. Weeds are a part of the fabric of our world. Weeds don't even have to be bad. They just have to be something that crowds Jesus out. And so Jesus said, some people listen to me and I know that their life is so cluttered. They've got bills that need to be paid. They've got assignments that need to get done. They've got their kids. They've got to get to practice. They've got to mow their yard. And, and they have too much noise in their life to really listen to what I'm saying to them. So a lot of people hear Jesus talk about the kingdom, but they don't get it. It's not because of the sower. It's not because of the seed. The kingdom only comes to those with good hearing, not callous ears, not cautious ears, not crowded ears. Some people listen with committed ears. He said, some people are hungry for God. Some people are, are tired of trying to run their lives and they are ready for God to just take over. They are hungry and thirsty for righteousness. When God's kingdom truth lands in a heart like that, watch out. Because explosive things are about to happen. The seed in a heart like that is going to bear bountiful fruit for the glory of God. Now, that is the parable of the sower. That's what the kingdom is like. And it speaks to us at two different levels, I believe. The first level 
is a level of indictment that says most of us, honestly, need to get our hearing checked. It's like the story I heard of a man years back that hailed a cab in New York City. He got in and the cab driver had very vulgar language. He kept using the name of Jesus as a, as a curse at other drivers in the traffic over and over while he was driving through the streets in New York City. And the man in the back seat was a believer. And finally, it really frustrated him. And he spoke up and he said, please, sir, don't use the name of Jesus that way. The Bible says you should not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. And the driver said, you don't need to quote the Bible to me. I went to Sunday school every day when I was a kid. I know that Bible by heart. And the man in the back seat said, no, sir, you know the Bible by memory. You do not know the Bible by heart. At one level, this story says to you and me, get your hearing checked. Are you really listening to what Jesus is saying? That's the level of indictment. But there's another level, encouragement. It speaks a word of hope to us today. Because some of us, just like John, were wondering, Jesus, how come there's so much crud in this world? How come so many people start, but they don't finish? And how come so many people pretend to be a Christian, but they're not? And some people say, well, that proves that all Christians are phonies. And it doesn't. Jesus actually said that it would be this way. But, but he says, don't get discouraged. The kingdom really has come. The seed, it's incredible. The harvest is inevitable. And the fruitfulness of the minority is going to be more than compensating for the fruitlessness of the majority. The mysterious kingdom is going to become the victorious kingdom. That's the point. So what does that mean for you and I in a practical way? Well, I'm going to give you three thoughts, and here's the first one. We must be obedient. We've got to sow. And we must sow everywhere. And we need to sow seed even in hard places. We don't have the right to sit back and judge certain people or certain parts of town or certain areas of the world and say, well, that's just too hard. Not going there. We throw seed everywhere. Because the seed is powerful. It's incredible. You ever seen seed that's growing up in the crack of asphalt? You just give the seed a chance and let the seed do what it does best. I bet you that Philippian jailer was a pretty hard old guy. But all it took was a little earthquake and a Bible study and he came to Jesus. You be obedient. And get the seed out. Second, we must be patient. Because you don't plant the seed and then harvest the seed on the same day. We have to plant and then we have to wait. Which means we have to trust God. And, and honestly, that's part of it. To understand the mystery of the kingdom means you have to understand that this is God's kingdom. And ultimately, we plant, we water, but God does the work. Jesus told a parable like that in Mark 4. And the only place in the Bible that you can find this particular parable, it says in Mark 4, verse 26, he also said, this is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed on the ground night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, though he doesn't know how. He doesn't know what's going on. This is God's kingdom. You go out there and you plant something in the ground. And when you go to bed, go to sleep. Let the seed do what it does. Because I'll tell you something. You can do what you can do, but God is the one in control. That. Palestinian farmer knows I can put my seed in the ground. I don't have control over whether or not it's going to rain. I don't have control whether or not that seed's going to get enough sun. I don't have control whether or not the wind's going to blow that seed away. I can do what I can do, but ultimately God decides the kind of harvest that I'm going to have. 
You plant the seed in somebody's heart, it might not even look like they are listening. I heard Lee Strobel, by the way, tell a story just recently, and it was incredible. He talked about he, he was working at the paper that he was working at, uh, at Chicago Tribune, um, after he had become a believer. And you guys know the case for Christ. You know the whole story. But he felt one day there was a person in human resources that, at, at the paper that he worked at that was just kind of a hardened old guy and he was a devout atheist and he knew about Lee Strobel's conversion and he didn't care too much for that. And God put it on his heart to invite him to Easter Sunday one particular day. And Easter was just around the corner. He's like, God, why this guy? This guy is just no way. So Lee obeyed and he went down to human resources, went up to the counter and said to the man, he said, hey, uh, our church is having Easter service coming soon. And I just wondered if you would be willing to come be a guest of my wife and I. He said, the man cursed at him and he says, you know, you can do your own thing with what you want, with your religion. You go ahead, but don't bring that stuff here to me. I don't want to hear any of it from you. And a few other expletives were added to the conversation. And he went on and he drove home and he's thinking, why did you have me do that, God? Why, why was I doing that? That guy never came to Easter Sunday. He never came to church. Years later, the man was still a, a rabid atheist. He thought that was just such a waste until after he had left the paper and gone into ministry. He was ministering at a church one Sunday morning when a man worked his way to the crowd after he had preached a message, came up to him and shook his hand. He said, you know, you're not going to know who I am. But there was a day when I had been called into the offices of human resources in Chicago at the Tribune, when you were working your way down there to talk to a man behind the counter, and that man was just mean to you. But I was working on the carpet on the other side of the room. I was behind the counter. I was stretching the carpet out, and I heard you speak to this man, and I thought, wow, man, I need to go to church. I said, you know what? My wife and I went to church that Easter Sunday, in fact, after a few weeks, we gave our life to Christ. And we've been going to church ever since. And I just need you to know, thank you so much. You know what's really cool? You have no idea what happens when you are obedient to throw in the seed. On soil that you might think might be hard, God may even have a whole different thing in vision for you that you never even can dream of. Well, here's the scoop. We don't make anything happen. We just sow. That's our job. We trust God. Because even though that seed is out of sight, it is not out of mind. So we plant. We wait. And just like a farmer, we pray. Some of you have planted seed. And you have been very close to giving up on that seed. Maybe it's your kid. Don't ever give up. Don't ever give up on the seed. You start watering that seed with prayer. And let God do what he does with that powerful life-giving seed. One more thing. We must be confident. A lot of people doubted Jesus. But he never doubted his own mission. He never doubted the power of the seed. He never doubted that through his preaching, the kingdom was something that was going to be launched that all of hell could not stop. He absolutely believed a harvest would come from fields all over the world. And it has. And it is. And it will. Can't you see it? It's not in the news cycle. The news cycles are always about earthly kings and kingdoms. But you can, you can see between the lines sometimes what God is doing in our world. Leith Anderson tells a story about when he was a boy, he grew up outside of New York City, and his favorite baseball team was the Brooklyn Dodgers. And his dad got him a ticket for his very first ball game ever. It was a World Series game. 
It was the Brooklyn Dodgers against the New York Yankees, and he was so excited because he knew the Dodgers are going to throttle the Yankees. Imagine his disappointment when not only did the Dodgers lose, but not a single Dodger got on base the whole game, and he was so defeated. Years later, he's telling a friend who was a walking sports almanac how deflating it was in his very first ball game for his favorite team. They didn't even get a man on base. And his friend said, you were there? You were at the game where Don Larson of the Yankees pitched the only perfect game in World Series history ever? You got to see that? You were there? Well, the truth was, he was there. But he didn't see it. He missed it. Because he was too caught up in his own agenda. And that can happen to you. You can get so caught up in your own kingdom that you don't see God's kingdom. God is doing something, people. And it's not in the news cycle. But God is doing something all over our world. The Bible says in the book of Revelation, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain And with your blood, you purchase men for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom. I'm begging you. Don't miss it. Look. Listen. And see the kingdom of God. Stand up. I want to pray over you. Father, we need this truth today. We really do. We need to hear this word today. In fact, we need to get better at hearing. We need to be better at seeing. So Lord, improve our hearing. Father, improve our vision. Deliver us from the vanity of of trivial pursuits and help us to see the kingdom all around us in Jesus' name.